This video is about pond life in winter's icy grip and its resurgence in spring. Because of the great diversity of pond life, I will only scratch the surface of the tip of the iceberg and offer more an appreciation of what happens as winter gives way to spring rather than an attempt at an exhaustive description. I hope you will see that many of these animals are fascinating and beautiful as well. In Maine, winter is a time when we bundle up to stay warm and enjoy the warmth from a fireplace or a hot drink. Wildlife don't have these luxuries and pond life seem to me to be particularly subject to the harsh environment that winter brings. If you're anything like me, you might have thought that as winter deepens, pond life would enter a dormant phase under the frozen surface just waiting for spring to start a renewal cycle. After all, the water temperature is near freezing and all the pond life I will be talking about is cold-blooded. So, in early February, I cut a 2 by 4 foot hole in the ice of a small main pond to see for myself. The air temperature that morning was 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the ice was 8 inches thick. The temperature of the water below the ice was 34 degrees Fahrenheit, which protected any aquatic life from the much colder temperature above the ice. I expected that if I were lucky, I might find a hibernating amphibian if I searched hard enough. Imagine my surprise to discover that life under the ice is actually quite active, all the way up the food chain. The first animals I encountered below the ice were swarming microinvertebrates, particularly tiny cyclops and daphnia, which serve as critical food for animals higher on the food chain. Cyclops are tiny crustaceans that generally live in slow-moving or still fresh water like this pond. They primarily eat smaller organisms and plant material. This cyclops is smaller than two millimeters or a tenth of an inch long. Its movements alternate between slow drifting and rapid jumps propelled by its pair of long antennae, which are also used in mating. You can see the motion of the antennae as the cyclops propels itself forward in the slow motion second half of the clip. Cyclops' smaller legs are a blur of motion in the video and are used primarily to collect minute food items. You can see more details of cyclops in the microscope image. The cyclops has a single eye, just like the monster of Greek mythology, indicated by the upper arrow. Furthermore, she is a female, as can be seen by the sack of eggs she carries. Another common microinvertebrate, the water flea, or daphnia, is also a small freshwater crustacean that, similarly to cyclops, uses the rhythmic beating of their many small legs to capture tiny food items. Their large antenna are used to swim in a jerky motion, as seen in the video, as this daphnia swims over the back of a salamander larva. Most daphnia throughout the year are female, as in this microscope image, which also shows the daphnia's antennae and single eye. This particularly female is not carrying any eggs at this time, but would ordinarily carry them in her ovary under her back. In addition to the nearly microscopic cyclops and daphnia, there are many macroinvertebrates under the ice that are considerably larger than cyclops and daphnia and can range from roughly half an inch to several inches long. I will focus only on a few kinds of insect. As you can see from the next few photos of the pond bottom, there is no shortage of these insects as they rest partially camouflaged on the bottom. Each view is about a foot across and there are red lines around each insect that I see, or about 10 to 20 per square foot of pond bottom. That's a lot of bugs. I wouldn't be surprised if I missed a few. When I first began looking under the ice, the most abundant macroinvertebrates were various species of caddisfly larvae. Caddisfly larvae are common in slow-moving or still water, like streams or ponds, and can be found slowly crawling on submerged rocks or plants or other material under the water. You may have seen them yourself and thought they were simply a small stick or bundle of twigs or clumps of sand in the water. The larvae can often be distinguished by the types of intricate shelters they build, characteristic head colors and patterns, as well as other features. Caddisfly larvae metamorphose in the spring into adult flying insects similar in appearance to moths and butterflies. One of my favorites is in the Phrygonaeidae family, from the Greek for dry sticks, which builds a two to three inch long spiraling cylindrical home out of plant material. 
If you look closely, you will see its striking yellow and black head emerging from one end. They were quite common and active despite a water temperature of about 34 degrees Fahrenheit. They move slowly and purposefully, as can be seen in this 10 times sped up video of a Phrygonaid larva and salamander larva. Both larvae seem to have their own mission as they crawl across the pond bottom. These caddisfly larvae are omnivores eating plant and animal material, often the form of organic matter or detritus that accumulates on the bottom of the pond. This short video shows a Phrygonaid larva foraging in the mud of the pond bottom. Well, foraging or just having a blast romping through the mud. Some Phrygonaids use small twigs or plant parts to build homes which look like tiny crude brooms. On the left of the photo, you can see the larva's yellow and black head peering out of its tube home. Other caddisfly larvae build bristly, twiggy log cabins. Notice the difference in head coloration and patterning of this larva. Rather than the striking yellow and black, it sports a much less gaudy brown head with dark spots. Caddisfly larvae are very adept on nearly any surface and can be found as they leisurely crawl foraging on the pond bottom along underwater plants over each other and even on the underside of the pond's frozen ice surface. Remarkably, some caddisfly larvae can survive being frozen in ice, as with this larva I found and slowly thawed. First you see a photo of the larva still embedded in ice. Following this is a clip of the thawed larva. I like to think it's waving with gratitude at being freed from its frozen confines. In addition to foraging on the bottom for food, caddisfly larvae can be aggressive predators and can be seen here preying upon wood frog eggs just one of the many reasons I'm glad I'm not a frog living in a pond, and even on other caddisfly larvae. In the first clip, a limnephalid larva has grabbed onto the end of a Phrygonaid larva's tube house. In the second clip, three Phrygonaid larvae are wrestling together. I can't be sure what they're doing, but it doesn't look like a reunion of long-lost friends. Other common macroinvertebrates under the ice include the similar bugs, water boatmen, and back swimmers, which can be comparably sized at about a half an inch in length. The quickest way to tell which is which is whether it is swimming on its back. If yes, it's generally a back swimmer, otherwise it's probably a water boatman. Also, if you're able to get a good look at their undersides, the water boatman's rear two pairs of legs are large and used for swimming while only the back swimmer's single rear pair of legs is enlarged. Unlike the water boatmen, which generally eat only plant material, back swimmers are carnivores and eat other small animals in the pond, and can apparently deliver a painful bite to a person who is not careful with them. So far, I've avoided that fate. You can also see whirligig beetles in the family Gyrinidae under the ice, little black watermelon seed shaped beetles. Perhaps you've been entranced by them as they scurry haphazardly on the water surface in the summer, but under the ice they swim more slowly or crawl on the underside of the ice as they scavenge food or prey upon other pond life. And I particularly like the bristly mustache this one is sporting. Whirligig beetles have a few interesting characteristics including an air bubble they carry which allows them to stay underwater for a very long time without coming to the surface, almost like a scuba diver with an air tank. Additionally, each of their eyes have distinct parts, which are designed to allow them to see simultaneously under and above the water. It is almost as though they have four eyes, a pair for looking above the water and a pair for looking below the water at the same time a very handy adaptation for an animal that lives on the surface at the interface between air and water. From the very first day I looked under the ice, I saw vertebrate animals, larval salamanders, bullfrog tadpoles, and adult eastern newts. They were much less common than the invertebrates, but were still regular visitors. Spotted salamanders lay eggs in the spring with some of the larvae maturing to adults after a single summer, 
and others overwintering on the bottom before becoming adults in their second summer. The larvae are one to one and a half inches long, and they sport feathery gills around their neck, enabling them to breathe under water, which they lose when they become adults. Lest you be lulled by their appearance into thinking that they are simply slow-moving, cute animals, know that they are predators, primarily eating smaller animals such as the cyclops that they snap up in this video. And I've slowed down the salamander's snap to let you see just how quick it can be. Just like spotted salamander larvae, some bullfrog and green frog tadpoles overwinter as well. However, unlike the salamander larvae and the adult bullfrogs and green frogs, the tadpoles are strict herbivores eating plant material like algae. One of the first vertebrates I saw under the ice was an adult eastern newt on February 10th. The adult is an olive-colored salamander with small reddish spots on its back and a light-colored belly. The adults have been found to play an important role as predators eating a variety of invertebrates such as mosquito larvae and other vertebrate eggs and larvae. And this last slide shows a pregnant eastern newt at the end of March in preparation for ice breakup and breeding. Ice breakup on the pond was particularly memorable for me as I fell through the thin ice while photographing in early April. April 10th, two days after my icy mishap, I heard the first wood frog mating calls, which I likened to the sound of arguing gnomes. Wood frog calls are often the first frogs we hear, and when I hear them, I know that spring is really here. Wood frogs are among the smaller frogs in the pond, usually no more than two to three inches, excluding the legs, with a dark brown facial mask against a lighter brown body. Wood frogs don't waste any time in long courtships after emerging from hibernation and migrating to the pond, as I observed mating and egg laying two days later on April 12th and then silence within a week. As you can see in the following photographs, breeding, also called amplexus, can occur on the surface or while submerged. As an aside to any male wood frogs watching this video and feeling secure that you have found a mate, as in this photo, don't be overconfident as other males in the neighborhood will be happy to try to break up your relationship. Within a few seconds, a second male appeared on the left and aggressively tried to push the male on the right away from the female. After a brief scuffle, the male on the right managed to repel the attack but we'll have to remain vigilant. Three is definitely a crowd when it comes to frog love. Typically, eggs are laid attached to underwater vegetation in large masses, as can be seen with the female wood frog in this photograph. When just laid, the eggs are little, black and white, jelly-enclosed balls, which soon change to all black or dark brown. Within 24 hours, the eggs are already dividing into tiny soccer balls. And they are on their way to becoming a tiny tadpole no more than a quarter of an inch long 16 to 20 days later. Adult spotted salamanders are large handsome amphibians with bright yellow spots along their bodies. They made their silent but dramatic appearance on April 12th as they migrated from their winter sanctuaries in the woods to the pond, forming large swirling congregations of salamanders performing mating dances. The males deposit packets of sperm called spermatophores on the pond bottom, which are then picked up by females, who lay their egg masses about two days later on underwater plants, twigs, and branches, as you can see with this female on a plant stem. Unlike the larval salamanders, which breathe underwater using their feathery gills, adult salamanders need to breathe air. You can see them as they make a beeline from the bottom of the pond to the surface to gulp air. The blue spotted salamander was much less common than its cousin, the spotted salamander, with a single blue spotted adult appearing on April 16th. It is smaller, 3 to 6 inches long compared to the 5 to 10 inch spotted salamander, and features small blue speckles against the dark blue-black background of its skin. For their size, they're the smallest frog at this pond, measuring less than 1.5 inches long, spring peepers can produce a lot of sound. If all the spring frogs formed a rock band, peepers would be the lead guitars. 
Being in the midst of a full evening chorus of peepers is exhilarating, but can be nearly deafening at the same time. They often have an X-like pattern on their backs. However, their most salient feature is their call, as it can take some practice to find them hiding in the grass or on twigs, but it is easy to hear them calling from a long distance away. Male peepers began calling in earnest around April 15th, and unlike the wood frogs who fell silent after a week of frenzied activity, continued calling loudly for at least two months. Apparently, comfort is not the most important factor when it comes to peeper love, as this male is perched on the thorny stem of a wild rose bush. And after all the calling and perching on thorns, if you're a lucky peeper, you will find a mate in the water or on the land. Three final species of frog stage spring entrances in this pond. Perhaps the most charismatic is the gray tree frog, which begins its evening calling in earnest in mid-May and can be found perched as high as five or six feet in bushes and trees during the breeding season. Their camouflage coloration can range from green to a mottled gray. Gray tree frogs are unusual in that they can change their coloration, not unlike a chameleon, to match the color of the surface they sit on. The male's call is a rapid trill, which can be heard in the woods as well as on the pond's edge, starting in the early evening and reaching a crescendo in the middle of the night. Like the other frog species at this pond, the adults are carnivorous, eating insects, spiders, and snails primarily. The call of the green frog has been likened to the sound of a plucked banjo string, and you can hear its call in this video with a background of chorusing gray tree frog trills. At our pond, the green and bull frogs don't call in as large choruses as the spring peepers, wood frogs, and gray tree frogs, rather tending to prefer solos, duets, or trios as they pluck their banjo strings or call their deep songs. Just as the bullfrog and green frog tadpoles can be confused, so can the adults, but for prominent ridges on the backs of green frogs called dorsolateral folds. In the green frog, the folds extend from behind the eyes along nearly the entire length of the back, while in the bullfrog, they terminate abruptly in a downward curve behind the eardrum. It's very nice when the animals are so helpful in aiding our identification of them. If the spring peepers lead guitar at our pond, bullfrogs are the kings and queens, as you can see in this photo of a king bullfrog ruling his small pond. Bullfrogs are aggressive predators, eating virtually anything they can fit in their mouths, from invertebrates like water beetles and dragonflies, to vertebrates like small snakes, mice, and even other frogs. They're the largest frogs in our pond, reaching up to nearly 8 inches in length, with even some of the older tadpoles being several inches long. Their call is a deep, resonant baritone, which can be heard from a long distance as the males stake out their territory. Earlier I mentioned the food chain at the pond, however in reality nature is not so orderly and is better described as a food web of interconnectedness. While taking some videos and photos of frogs, I noticed tiny mosquitoes having a meal at the frog's expense, and to close the circle from the small to the large and back again at this pond, here are a few photos of mosquitoes biting a spring peeper, a green frog, and yes, even the king of our pond, a bullfrog. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope even more that it will spark interest in and desire to explore the amazing world around us. This was just shot at a pond in our backyard, and offers only a tiny glimpse of the wonder around us that may be just around the corner on a log, up a tree, or under the ice.